A warm welcome to all members and friends. Thank you for joining our English pre-recorded worship service. Shall we rise for the call to worship? Sing of God's mercy and grace. Sing of God's strength and might. Praise God with laughter and joy. Praise God with feasting and dance. For God protects the lowly and avenges the misdeeds of the mighty. God brings forth justice and righteousness, saving the weak from the cruelty of the powerful. Sing of God's mercy and grace. Sing, Sing of, of God's, God's strength, strength and, and might. might. Sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. of a multitude of those from every tribe and tongue we are your people redeemed by your blood rescued from death by your love there are no words good enough to thank you there are no words to express my praise But I will lift up my voice And sing from my heart With all of my strength Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah To the Lamb, hallelujah, hallelujah by the blood of Christ we stand, every tongue, every tribe, every people. 
Please remain standing as we continue our worship in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for bringing us together this morning with reverence and awe. We worship you. We acknowledge that Jesus Christ came to earth as a man in order to live the sinless life that we cannot live, that he died in our place so that we would not have to pay the penalty that we deserve. Lord Jesus, your sacrifice is a precious gift to each one of us. Thank you. Thank you for your steadfast love that endures forever. May we keep trusting in you and not be afraid. May we keep our eyes fixed on you, walking in your way. Most merciful God, forgive us in your mercy that we have so often allowed our desires and expectations to rule our lives. Lord Jesus, may you teach us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Yes, Lord, shine, shine in our hearts. We ask God, cleanse us from all our sins. Compassionate God, we bring before you those among us who are sick and weak. By your grace, may you grant them strength and courage may you draw them near and give them peace in their times of weakness and pain may you restore them to good health according to your will loving lord speak as we receive the food of your holy word may you plant your truth deep in us mold us in your likeness and lead us into your presence draw us close to you we ask all this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today is Sunday School Sunday. So let us celebrate this day, giving thanks to God for His faithfulness and goodness. I shall now introduce the teachers by the levels in Sunday School. So from the nursery and kindergarten, we have the following teachers. Selina Tan, Juliet Teo, Lim Siu Ki, Rebecca Lee, Angela Tan, Chua Gek Eng, Yu Ping, Grace, Felicia, Lance and Jamie Tan, Joyce, Anthony Chua, Florence, Ri and Sharon. Teachers who are not in the picture are Li Ai Li, Teo Chiu Yen. From the primary and junior levels, the teachers are Lam Ji Kyung, Sui Wei Kuang, Von Hui, Gong In Leong, Denise Lim, Chin Pei Ro, Patsy Ling, Philip Leong, Oi Lin Li, Zhong Zi. And from the teens, the teachers are Lao Li Yang, Jonathan Ching, Gerald Tan, Jasper Tan, Daniel Ling, Jonathan Yeo, Clara Tan, Elizabeth Li, Shu Mui Ying, Jessica Tan and Zhou Jing. Let us now commit all our teachers to God in prayer. Lord Jesus, 
Thank you for the teachers who have been so faithfully serving in the Sunday school week after week. Thank you for these teachers who so readily and willingly adjust to conducting classes online during this pandemic in this new normal. Holy Spirit, may you grant the teachers perseverance and confidence during this trying time and arm them with strength and manage whatever circumstances that they may encounter. May you encourage the teachers as they explore new ways to engage the children and with the teens in the class as they nurture the children and teens in their spiritual growth. We also ask that Lord, may you grant the teachers good health physically, mentally and spiritually. O oh Lord, may the overshadowing of your presence be with our teachers. Protect them, we ask. May your blessing be upon the teachers, the ambassadors for Christ. Lord Jesus, we also remember the children and the teens in the Sunday school. We ask for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be upon all of them, that they will do all that is pure and right. Yes, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, empower the teens and the children from the nursery, kindy, primary, junior levels to walk in your truth. Lord, give them an undivided heart that they may worship you with all their heart, their mind, and so, may all of them grow in the fruit of the Spirit. May your name be glorified. Lord, this is our prayer that we bring to you today in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Scripture reading for this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. Verse 5. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. The second passage is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. Verse 17 This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. How do you usually start a conversation? Especially with someone that you are not familiar with or someone whom you meet for the first time. Often, we start off with the weather. It has been raining for the last few days. The scorching heat is unbearable. And nowadays, we ask one another when we meet online, how are you coping? And some of us talk about our hobbies and passions. So, there is a fervent soccer fan who always speaks as if the sport is the best in the world. So during a welcome lunch for a new colleague before the COVID, he is more than eager to talk about his favourite football club. Manchester United. So he tirelessly describes how good the team is, justifies his performances and even pledges his undying devotion and support for the club in good and bad times. Then he looked eagerly at his new colleague, seemingly waiting for an agreement. And here comes the reply. 
I am a supporter of Liverpool. Behold, I'm not that hardcore fan, okay? But that is usually how we would put up a defence, isn't it? A means of protection and security against attacks or possible attacks of others. A means to prove our innocence for something that we did not do. Yes, we defend for a reason, for a cause. We defend ourselves from overwhelming fear or anxiety. Bosses defend staff from unjust criticism. Lawyers defend clients from suspected charges. And soldiers defend the country from attacks. Parents, what do they do? They defend their children from harm. Siblings defend their personal territories from intrusion. And of course, regular exercise is the best defense against fatigue and many more instances. Today, our passage is also about defense. It is Paul's defense of his ministry and his apostolic authority to the Corinthian church. Why did Paul need to defend his ministry? Here, let me give you a little background. Now, Paul planted the church in Corinth on his second missionary journey. While in Corinth, he devoted himself full-time to the ministry of the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and rejected him, Paul went to the Gentiles. So the believers in Corinth consisted of Jews, the God-fearers, and the Gentiles. There were much that they had to learn. But there was also opposition. Paul's opponents in Corinth had doubted him and his ministry. They questioned his motives. And on top of all this, they questioned Paul's authority as an apostle. How could Paul, who had suffered so much to be a spirit-filled apostle of the risen Christ? So, Paul needed to vindicate his apostleship in the face of these false accusations. And this morning, we shall look at two key areas as Paul defend his ministry, credential and authority. In his epistle, Paul defends that God is the one who has the top credentials. God alone has the authority. And friends, we have to bear in mind that this is not just a story of Paul the Apostle. These areas present themselves in our daily living and ministry too. Firstly, in the area of credential. So what is credential? Credential is a qualification, an achievement of a person, and it is usually used to determine one's suitability for something. Plainly speaking, it is like a license that proves one's qualifications. So for example, a certificate or degree is an academic credential which is largely referred to in recruitment. The result is what we commonly call the paper chase, striving to acquire numerous credentials in order to secure or raise the chance of being employed, being affirmed. What's more, credential can also provide the confidence, belief and credibility of a person. And Credential is important because it is an evidence of authority, status, rights, and even entitlement to privileges. I remember my pastor asking me why I wanted to go to seminary. And my reply was that I am a collector of certificates. Well, he knew I was joking then, otherwise I'm probably not here today. But really, what credential do you carry with you today? And more importantly, as a Christian, what credential do you carry with you in ministry? From verse 5, You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. In his letters, Paul's focus has always been Christocentric, that is, Christ is in the centre of it all. This is largely driven by his conversion on the road to Damascus. Acts 9 verses 10 to 19 gives us a vivid account 
of how Paul, who was known as Saul, saw the risen Christ and converted. He recognized the encounter as a call to apostleship, a mission to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. Since then, Paul puts the gospel above everything. Preaching is not about himself, but the risen Christ. In contrast, his opponents put themselves above everything. Preaching is about themselves and they boast of their achievements. In fact, such an attitude is also found in churches today. Some pastors and leaders want to be known, expect to be recognised, yet they do not have time for members. And sadly, preaching becomes a stage performance. But that is not what it's supposed to be. Paul knows that he has been called to lead people to Jesus Christ and to build them up in their faith. And here in verse 5, Paul preaches that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul declares that we preach Christ crucified. Now friends, we need to remember that at the heart of Paul's gospel, it is all about Jesus Christ. And putting these verses together, we know that Jesus Christ whom Paul preaches is Lord. Jesus Christ whom Paul preaches is Christ crucified. So Jesus Christ whom we call Lord, whom we are called to submit, is also the crucified one, the one who died for us. Paul wants the Corinthians to know and to proclaim the Lordship of Christ, who is the master of their lives. Therefore, in his preaching, Paul does not promote himself or his authority. Instead, he regards himself as a servant of believers for Jesus' sake. Does that mean they are his masters? No. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, that yet for us there is one God the Father for whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Yes, there is only one God, one Lord. What is Paul's credential again? An apostle of Christ. Does that give him the right to boast to the other believers? No. Does that give him the privilege to command and dominate? No, because Paul focuses on his service to Christ by means of serving other believers. Friends, this is a reminder for you and me today. We fight over the car park lots. We argue whether or not to change or trim the overgrown plants around the church building. We claim ownership of ministry. We disagree on the duration of worship service. We accuse each other for not turning off the aircon after using the meeting room. We disagree whether it is lucky draw or blessing draw. We even upset one another whether to put up a picture of the cross or Jesus on the website. And many more. Now this seem trivial. But aren't we spending the bulk of our time on this silly, absurd matters? We have been more concerned with who's in charge than proclaim the gospel of Christ. Friends, Christ is the Lord of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Christ rules and governs his people. Christ directs his people towards the fulfillment of God's purposes. Therefore, let us be content with the role of servant, servant of believers for Jesus' sake. Paul further explains in verse 6 the reason he preaches Jesus Christ as Lord. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, the first instance where we get the picture of light and darkness is in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. 
And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. Here, it is probable that Paul gives the idea that it is God's light that makes everything new, banishing darkness. This light is found in the face of Christ, where Paul describes Christ in Colossians 1, that He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is so assuring, isn't it? Does this give you the assurance that Paul enjoyed? So much so that he puts Christ above everything. Even in the midst of suffering, Paul was courageous. For Christ's sake and the ministry of the gospel, Paul willingly becomes the ambassador in chains. I always admire and respect Sunday school teachers but I did not have a chance to attend Sunday school. So when I started attending church and during a ministry fair, I signed up to be a Sunday school teacher without hesitation. And almost immediately, I was assigned as an assistant teacher in the primary two class. Not bad, I should be able to handle, I told myself, but I found myself so lost in class. I don't know the books of the Bible, I can't remember the Bible verses. I gave excuses to skip meetings. And the only work that I could help was to organize all the worship songs in alphabetical folders, buy refreshments for the classes. That continued for more than a year, until one day when few teachers were unavailable to teach on the same Sunday, I was told to stand in. And by God's grace, all went smoothly. And I started teaching until I left for seminary. What was the first thing that I do? Go to God in prayer. Because I know that I cannot do it myself. I have been occupied with my own world, my expectation of myself and the class. It was also then that I totally let go my fear and anxiety, acknowledging Christ above everything. The rest is history. Fruitful, Beautiful memories. Friends, what are the credentials we should protect at all costs? Preach not ourselves. Preach Jesus is Lord. Preach as servants of believers for Jesus' sake. Because Christ is the image of God. Because Christ is the agent of God in creation and providence because Christ is the head of the church. And in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Next, the second area, authority. To begin, what is authority? It is the power or right to give orders, make decisions and enforce obedience. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. From the verses, we know that God alone has the authority. Let us do some unpacking here. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Because of what God had done through Jesus Christ, if one believes in Christ, 
He is a new creation. A new creation, it means being made alive in Christ. He who lived in darkness is now given a new life when he came to faith. And most importantly, he now lives by the power of the risen Christ. If a person is in Christ, he belongs to Christ. He lives now by the power of the risen Christ. He is united with Christ. He is a member of the body of Christ. And being in Christ should bring about a radical change in a person's life. The scripture gives explicit order or instructions on how a person should live. For instance, Ephesians chapter 4 verses 25 to 29 lists the big changes in a new life. Stop lying and speak truth. Be angry and do not sin. Stop stealing, but work and share. Stop tearing people down, but use words to build them up. Be kind, tender-hearted. Be forgiving, as God in Christ forgave you. Yes, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Our whole being, the value system, our behavior are all changed through conversion. So we also must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. God, who has full authority, has delivered us from the bondage of sin. Through Christ, God reconciles us to himself. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciles us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Apostle Paul has always claimed that the love of Christ is the motivation for service. His duty is to proclaim the reconciliation accomplished by Christ. Friends, that is also our duty. But what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is the restoration of friendly relations. Sometimes we may argue with friends and especially for the little kids. We commonly hear, I don't want to friend you anymore. But after a while, they become friends again. Now between God and man, reconciliation is the removal of human enmity toward God. Because of sin, we are separated from God. But God, in His mercy and grace, takes the initiative in bringing about reconciliation. Reconciliation is an act of God's grace. And the means of reconciliation is the death of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, God reconciles us to Him. God breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between Him and man. Our union with Christ means that we are no longer living for self, but for His glory. So in one sense, reconciliation has been accomplished. Through Christ, God has reconciled us to Himself. But God gave us the ministry of reconciliation, indicating that the reconciliation is a continuous process. And Paul knows that God's act of reconciliation did not end with the death and resurrection of Christ. The apostolic work of Paul is now assigned to continue the incomplete task. What is left alone? To proclaim the word of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. And friends, we have also been entrusted with this task. I received my first Bible when I was 16, given to me by my classmate. Children bring friends to children parties in church. Now we are never too young or old to take up the task. And we need to remember that it is not that we must reconcile ourselves to God. Rather, we are to be reconciled. That is, to accept what God has achieved. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. What does that involve? 
sacrifice, sufferings, which Paul shares in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Friends, do you suffer the same like Paul? Perhaps most of us can resonate with verse 28. The daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. I asked this question in the beginning. How could Paul, who had suffered so much, to be a spirit-filled apostle of the risen Christ? Now, this passage about God's reconciling work is the answer. Paul fervently and earnestly seeks to defend the ministry of reconciliation despite sufferings. Because he knows it is all in God's plan to reconcile the whole world to himself. It all begins with God's initiative. His task is to proclaim what God has done in Christ and not what he was doing for Christ. That is so crucial that Paul needed to defend. Not only does Paul proclaim the word of reconciliation, he leaves a message himself to always carry in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Friends, how about us? When I decided to go full-time ministry, many people asked why I am giving up a career that I have built over the years. Do I know that I will get a pay cut and many more? My reply is always the same. Nothing can be compared to what Jesus had done on the cross. It is my duty as a child of God to proclaim the good news to the world. To proclaim to the world, be reconciled to God. Friends, how can we keep such amazing grace, love and joy of reconciliation to ourselves? What I admire Paul is his perseverance and courage. He never shouts, I quit. How did he do it? Because he belongs to Christ and he knows what he possessed in Jesus Christ. Are you grumbling that no one is helping you in ministry? Or are you complaining that no one seems interested in your proposal? Are you saying a stop to ministry because you have piles and piles of homework from school? Are you sick of ministry altogether? Friends, Paul rejoiced in what he has and he encourages us that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How about you? Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for your steadfast love that endures forever. Grant us courage to proclaim your word of reconciliation to people that we meet. Give us words of wisdom and help us to stay focused in the task that you have commissioned us. Help us to appreciate one another in ministry, learn from one another, encourage one another, and to grow spiritually with one another as we serve together. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings. Special welcome to you if you are joining us first time online. All right, let's stand right now and greet each other with the words, the peace of God be with you. Let's stand.
Thank you. Please be seated. Now seated, can you text the same words, the peace of God be with you, to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Text the words now, the peace of God be with you. I'm going to give you some time for this. Here are some announcements. New Testament reading challenge. We are now into week 11. Trust that God is doing speaking to you as you read His Word. Do stay back. Uh, at the end of the service, the Bible clip would be on 2 Corinthians. Okay? 2 Corinthians. The 12th session of the General Conference of the Methodist Church in Singapore. It ended on Friday, and we want to congratulate Reverend Dr. Uh, Gordon Wong, Bishop elect of the Methodist Church in Singapore. We also want to congratulate Bishop Chong Ching Chung uh, on being conferred the title Emeritus upon his retirement. Finally, we also want to congratulate our brother uh, Yao Huang. Uh, for being elected as the um, Secretary of Trustees, or SOT as we call it, of the Methodist Church in Singapore. May God's grace be upon them and upon all the office holders. Same-sex attraction talks. Uh, the schedule for October, if you have not signed up, please sign up. The details are on the screen. Closing date, 30th of September. Sign up, please. Now, earlier we uh, prayed for the teachers in the Sunday school. Right now, we're going to pray for our young people who will be facing examinations. Um, normally, what we'll do is uh, I'll invite them to come forward uh, in church and then I'll invite the parents to come forward and stand behind them. Now, since this is not possible, what I'm going to do is I am going to read their names and then I will ask uh, at the same time for them to stand. Uh, if your names are read, I ask you to stand and at the same time, I ask that your parents also stand then together as a church, we will be praying for you and your parents. Both the face, those who are facing PSLE and the older ones will be facing their exams too. Right now, I just want to read your names. Names are provided by the Sunday School and the Youth Ministry. As I read your names, if you're watching, I ask you to stand. Ho Shiren, Hannah Lee, Di Chen Sing, Tong Hong Him, Ashton Tan, Matthew Ko, Augustus Surya, Di Jia Li, Xavier Wong. Now, if you are facing PSLE and your names are not mentioned on the screen, I invite you to also to stand. Like now, also ask that your parents, uh, parents of the names that are being mentioned, can you also now stand? Together now as a church, let's pray. Father God, we pray right now for those who are facing the PSLE. Father, I want to pray for your strength on each and all as they prepare for the exams. Keep them in good health. Help them in their preparations. Father, I pray especially that during this time they will experience the steadfast love and your mercy. Be with the parents too. Remind them not to be anxious 
instead to trust you for their children's life. May your peace be with them. In Jesus' name, Amen. There's also another group of young people, our youths, who will also be facing exams. Same thing. Now on the screen, their names are being presented. And I request that as I read out the names, uh, as you watch this, please stand. At the same time, I will be asking for your parents to stand with you. Again, if you are facing examinations and your name is not on the screen, I invite you also to join in. Crystal Ko, Ng Song En, Isaac Siu, Yo Su En, Elizabeth Ling, Hung Ka Ding, Ashley Tan. Parents, please stand with them and together as a church, we now pray. Father God, I pray right now that as the youths come and face their examinations, you will give them strength on each and all. Help them to prepare for the examinations. Keep them in good health. Help them to experience your steadfast love and mercy during this time. Lord, that you help them to trust in you. We want to pray also for their parents. Father, remind them to trust you and not to be anxious. Fill them with your peace. Help them to model your love to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The third group of our young people will also be facing their exams, their A's and their IB. I just want to ask, same thing, that as their names are being read, I ask them to stand. At the same time, I ask that their parents also would stand with them. Again, if uh, you are facing examinations and your name is not on the screen, do stand up because we also want to pray uh, for and with you. Rachel. Sung, Denise Xia, Alicia Tan, Ray Pang, Daniel Tan, Rachel Tan, Rui Wen Yi, and Benjamin Ong. I invite you to stand. At the same time, I invite Parents, if your children's name have been called, please stand with them. Now together as a church, we will pray. Father, we ask that you will give your peace to your children. As they prepare for the examinations, help them to know that the future is in your hands. Help them not to be anxious. Help them to study and prepare in the way that they are most capable of. Help them, even then, to be good witnesses of your love and your mercy to you before their friends. Father, we want to pray also for the parents. Again, we ask that you will help the parents commit their children to you, that they would trust you for all things, that they will have that peace in their hearts, knowing that you, Father God, is in charge of every single facet of their lives. This, Father, we pray 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's prepare ourselves right now for the tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father God, in gratitude, we now return to you a portion of what you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right on the screen, right now, our giving methods, scan the QR code to give your tithes and offerings online. Scan the QR code to give your tithes and offerings online. I'm going to give you some time for this. If you are sending in a check to the office, do remember to contact Wendy first, right? If you are sending a check, do contact Wendy first. Let's rise for the doxology. Go forth, be strong in the Lord as you defend the gospel. Receive the benediction. So now the love of God.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you today and the days that follow. Amen. Please be seated. The service is now over. See you next Sunday. Do stay back and watch the video clip on 2 Corinthians. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Even though it's called second or two Corinthians in our Bibles, there are multiple clues within this letter that it's not the second thing he ever wrote to the church of ancient Corinth. Paul started this Jesus community in Corinth some time ago on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the story in the book of Acts chapter 18. And after moving on, Paul got a report that things were not going well there. So he wrote the letter that we call 1 Corinthians to correct these problems. And it appears that many in the church rejected Paul's teaching in that letter and rebelled against his authority. And so we learn in this letter that Paul had followed up in person with what he calls the painful visit. And after that, he sent a letter which he says was written with anguish and tears. And so after all these measures, most but not all of the Corinthians realized their arrogance and they apologized to Paul. They wanted to reconcile. And so Paul wrote this letter to assure them of his love and commitment. The letter's been designed with three main sections, each addressing a distinct topic. So Paul first finalizes his reconciliation with the Corinthians. Then in chapters 8 and 9, he addresses the topic of forgotten generosity. And in the final chapters, Paul challenges the remaining Corinthians who still reject him. Let's dive in and you'll see how it all works. So Paul opens up by thanking the God of all mercy and comfort who brought peace and encouragement to him and the Corinthians during this time of division and dispute. He acknowledges that things have been tense since this painful visit and he makes clear he's forgiven them. He wants an open and honest relationship. But why had they rejected Paul in the first place? Well, we discover later in this letter that the Corinthians had disregarded Paul as a leader. He was poor. He earned a meager living through manual labor. He was under constant persecution and suffering. He was often homeless. And to top it off, he wasn't a very impressive public speaker. And so once the Corinthians were exposed to other more wealthy, impressive Christian leaders, they started to think less of Paul. They were actually ashamed of him. 
So Paul responds first by showing that their elevation of these leaders simply because of their wealth and eloquence is a betrayal of Jesus. It shows a totally distorted value system. True Christian leadership, Paul says, is not about status or self-promotion. Paul depicts himself and the other apostles as captive slaves to King Jesus, who's leading them on a procession of triumph. Paul's job isn't to be impressive, but rather to point people to the one who is. Jesus. He then alludes to a recent demand of the Corinthians that he provide some letters of recommendation to prove his authority and credentials, and this is ridiculous to Paul. Their church wouldn't even exist if he hadn't started it, and so he says they are his proof of genuine leadership. They are his letter of recommendation. He cleverly quotes from the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, saying that God's Spirit has written his letter of recommendation on their hearts as his new covenant people. The Corinthians shouldn't need Need any more proof than that. Now, the mention of the new covenant, it leads Paul into a long comparison between the old covenant between God and Israel that was mediated by Moses and the new covenant between God and the Corinthians mediated by Jesus and the Spirit. The old covenant made at Mount Sinai, it was truly glorious. It made Moses himself shine with God's glory, but that glory eventually faded. Not to mention the fact that the laws of that covenant were ineffective at truly transforming Israel. But the new covenant, by comparison, is even more glorious because the resurrected Jesus is the very glory of God and he lives on forever. And it's his spirit that's now transforming people to become more faithful just like Jesus himself. Now this all sounds amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to share in God's own glory? But Paul goes on to show how the paradox of the cross turns upside down the Corinthians' ideas of glory and success. After all, Jesus' glorious exaltation as king took place through his suffering, execution, and death. On the cross, Jesus revealed God's salvation. He died for the sins of the world to reconcile people to God. But the cross does even more. It reveals God's character. He's a being of utter self-giving, suffering love that seeks the well-being of others. The cross also reveals a new cruciform way of life. And Paul's goal is that his life and ministry imitates the cross. So although his apostolic career it has been marked by humility, suffering, by poverty, it was all to serve the Corinthians. And so when they disapprove of Paul's poverty and suffering, they disapprove of Jesus too. Paul's way of life and leadership is actually the proof that he authentically represents the crucified and risen Jesus. Paul really wants to reconcile with the Corinthians, but he won't let things lie until they've been transformed and embrace this upside down paradox of the cross. After this passionate appeal, Paul moves on to address the topic of forgotten generosity. So the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem, they had fallen into poverty due to a famine. And Paul was raising money among the new churches that he started, full of mostly non-Jews. They would all send a relief gift as a symbol of their unity in the Messiah, Jesus. And so many of his churches, they were thrilled to give. But the Corinthians, in the midst of all this conflict with Paul, hadn't saved up for the gift. And for Paul, this isn't just about money. It's another sign that the Corinthians have not been transformed by the gospel about Jesus, which at its heart is a story of generosity. Paul says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He's telling the story of the gospel through financial metaphors. Jesus gave up his glorious honor, or wealth, and he lowered himself to die like a poor slave, so that other people who are impoverished through sin and death can be exalted and become wealthy through the riches of God's grace. To be a Christian is to let this story sink deep into your mind and heart, letting it transform you into someone who's more generous, more willing to share your life and resources to help others. In the final section of the letter, Paul focuses on the main source of his conflict with the Corinthians, that group of impressive leaders that he sarcastically calls super apostles. So they came to Corinth promoting themselves and badmouthing Paul as a poor, unsuccessful leader. And at the risk of sounding self-promoting, Paul says, do these guys really want to compare credentials? He can totally take them on. Are they Jewish Bible experts? Well, so is Paul. He was a Pharisee, for goodness sakes. He has the whole Bible memorized. Do they want to brag about their superior knowledge of Jesus? Paul has actually seen and hung out with the risen Jesus. He's actually had visions of Jesus' heavenly throne room. 
But more importantly, Paul has given his entire life to the mission of Jesus. He sacrificed comfort and stability, and he never asked the Corinthians for money. Unlike the super apostles who charged a lot, Paul earned his own living. But, Paul says, he refuses to brag about these accomplishments because these aren't the things that really matter as a Christian. Instead, what he'll brag about is how flawed and how weak he is because it's in those inadequacies that he discovers the love and mercy of Jesus. Or as Jesus once told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect through weakness. Paul concludes the letter with a sober warning to the Corinthians. They need to check themselves. Their contempt for Paul, his way of life, their love for these super apostles, it all shows that they don't grasp who Jesus is on a fundamental level. They're not living like transformed followers of Jesus, and so he invites them once again to humble themselves before the love of Jesus. 2 Corinthians gives us a really unique window into the life of Paul and the paradox set before us by the cross of Jesus. The cross challenges our values, our ways of seeing the world. We value success, education, wealth, but God values humility and weakness because his love and power were made known through the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. The cross also unleashes the transforming power and presence of the Spirit to empower Jesus' followers to take up his cruciform way of life and make it their own. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about.